All right. So, so this is the this is the mapping, uh, the, the the mapping of the CRS terms. Now, the terms themselves are, are publicly available, and um, David from Archives showed showed an expression of them online. Um, and behind the scenes, the terms are listed in a in a in a relational database. And and you don't just have the terms; you've got the individual terms and also terms that those terms are related to and the type of relationship. So these are semantic relationships right here. And so, um, uh, Nagin, yes. this is an expression of exactly what you were asking about, not in, in RDF or anything like that. Um, yep. On the right column where you see NT, that's a narrower than match. And where you see EQ, that's an equals match. Now these are um, local uh, terms being used within the CRS system, um, but we can map them out to RDF and that's exactly what we've done. So the process goes something like this. We just do a few transformations in Excel to um, to get unique IDs and um, and neatly printable labels for these terms. Um, so that's straight just co uh, column transformations. Then we take the actual semantic relations in their system, and uh, there was a bit of discussion between David and myself. Um, as to exactly what it means. Now, NT clearly means narrower than or narrower in Scots, um, but the, the, a few of the other matches required a bit of understanding to work out what the Scots equivalent terms uh, mappings were. And I was very unkeen to invent new semantic relations. If, if possible, I would reuse existing ones. So here you see a Scots relation and then the particular term IDs. Again, these are just tra uh, column transformations straight out of the Excel. Um, and on the right column there, the full relation, that's just concatenating bits and pieces from various columns, but it's approaching an RDF format right there. Um, and then finally, I extract that column and a few other bits and pieces and actually create an RDF file. And I take that RDF file um, and I put it through a validator just to check that's all, that I've formatted it correctly. Um, and then that validator also reformats it kind of neatly. Um, one thing that's important to know is that because of the way RDF and graph systems work, if you've got all of your information in Excel or some other tabular system, um, you can assert each property of terms and each term relation just in series, you know, one after the other after the other. Put that all into your final Excel column, put that into text, throw that into a, uh, an RDF graph system and it will normalize and, and join everything up. So you don't have to spend forever. You, you've got to get the identity of all the elements and joins correct in Excel, but you don't have to yourself join it up. Um, if, if the word matches, the, the graph database systems would do all the joining. Um, so, so this is an, an easy one because the, the terms in the CRS system already had all the semantic information. Um, in other systems, that information isn't there and um, you know, other work has to be done. Um, but this is this is one of the easy ones. Um, oh, so this is this is a, a different piece of information. It's actually core to the project, but I didn't have time. I thought to present it in the main presentation. It's really just handling the change changes that we experience in the project. So um, we can have changing government entities. So here the, the diagram is just showing a a theoretical split. So agency X gets split into agencies Y and Z. Um, and the way we deal with this kind of change is just to have these change events um, able to be recorded. Now, the National Archives database already does this with change events and, and preceding and succeeding agencies. Um, and I, we're not sure if the AGOR system at the Department of Finance tracks all this information. If it doesn't, we're going to have a hell of a job back working out all those change events. But nevertheless, we can think of all the ways in which agencies change and we can describe that change through a series of change events. So that handles changing organizations or entities. When concepts change, it's a bit different. Um, within the vocabularies, we don't have too many examples of this um, within a vocabulary, but certainly across vocabularies, we've got um, departments that are associated with functions. So here you've got department X associated with function Y, uh, but if, if um, function Y gets superseded by function Z, then of course we can infer that now department X is associated with function Z. And we have to know whether Y and Z are equivalent so that back in time we can say the department was associated with function Z or is it, you know, is it going forwards only? So that, those are kind of the, the, the nuances there. But in general, we can handle changing concepts within vocabularies themselves. And as David mentioned, having different, having a split between the organizations and 
the functions and the organizations, in his case, and the record series um, allows for you to sort of handle change in all of those environments. But now there's a really tricky one. This is the last slide I've got. It's, it's managing change between entity function mappings. So um, it's, it's now, we've got an entity that itself may or may not have changed. Let's say it hasn't changed, so department X. Um, but, and the functions themselves haven't changed, but the mapping has. So department X has acquired a new function. Um, and so the way we deal with that is we say, in a simple way, we would say department X is associated with function Y. That's not enough information to handle entity function mappings. So, so then we say, look, let's, let's take that relation out and talk about information about that relation. And so in the next, the more information section I've got there, the subject of this relation is department X. The particular kind of relation is, is the associated function one. Um, so that's the predicate. The object here is function Y. So the first three, three lines of that more information section are exactly the same as the top assertion. Uh, department X associated with function Y. However, we can say anything else we want about it. Now here I've just got created at time. So when was this assertion created at time A? And then perhaps this assertion was invalidated at time B. So maybe it was, maybe department X was associated with function Y in 2014. And then due to machinery of government changes or, or something, um, it, it was unassociated with that function in 2018. So you'd have created time at 16 and invalidated time at, at 18. Um, so now we've got a time bound association and we could put any other information in there. Um, now, of course, the departments themselves can be changed and the functions can be changed. So you can see with these three uh, techniques, we can handle an awful lot of change. Um, and it's, it's no different to what databases with different elements like the CRS are already doing. Um, but here we have a, a very powerful extensible method uh, we can map across vocabularies, we can version, we can change within the vocabularies, we can map across data sets. I haven't actually talked too much about how you would map a department in one to an agency in the other, but you can imagine it's similar. Um, and then here's this, uh, this general technique of, of talking about asserted relations and, and link sets do this. Link sets say, look, here's an association I'm, I'm making. And if we want to, we can record any amount of information about that assertion like times as you see here, but also things like what, what logic or what method was used to actually create this assertion? So if it's a human asserted thing between two uh, vocabulary terms, we might the method might be, you know, David Herder's expertise. <laughs> um, but if it's a statistical mapping, we might say the method here is, um, you know, emergent statistics from some kind of analysis. So that's really the end of my presentation there.